Welcome to In the Arena, a show where entrepreneurs and leaders take us behind the headlines and into the biggest crises of their careers and lives and how they made it to the other side. I'm Jesse Janae, a startup founder and your host, frequently joined by guest hosts who have also built companies and seen some things themselves. On this season of In the Arena, we ask our guests to relive their most challenging professional and personal moments in painstaking detail, from major deals collapsing to public scandals and even being sent to prison. More importantly, we hear how they came back from the brink as they share their biggest lessons, mental frameworks, and earned wisdom with us. So let's go into the arena. On our debut episode of In the Arena, we're being transported into a tumultuous period for Uber, told through the eyes of our guest, Emil Michael. I'm also joined by co-host Eric Torenberg, a startup founder, investor, and podcaster. Emil was famously the chief business officer at Uber during their meteoric and frankly incomparable growth from 2013 to 2017, as well as CEO Travis Kalanick's right hand. Few leaders in tech have accomplished so much in terms of raw user and revenue growth, as well as funding success. Also, few leaders have personally experienced so much turmoil. So I got home, or back to the office with Travis, and then Eddie Q, who is always in the meetings, calls me. He's like, I got to tell you something. We're about to announce a billion dollar investment in Didi. And this was the same day we had just met with Tim Cook, and he's picking our brain about our China business. And I was, I was like, oh my God, I got played by Tim Cook. <laughs> Holy cow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Holy, Holy shit. shit. That was my, my feeling. Just, today, he joins us to go in depth on the hashtag delete Uber campaign that gripped the company and frankly, social media writ large in early 2017. Personally, I was taken aback by Emil's humility and candor about this painful period. And I enjoyed his reflections on how he might have handled pivotal moments differently like Uber's unsuccessful bids to acquire rival Lyft. We are here today joined by a very special guest, Emil Michael, former chief business officer at Uber, one of the most iconic companies of Jesse's and I's uh, entrepreneurial uh, career. Um, and we are very lucky to have you, Emil. Thank you so much for joining in the arena. That's uh, great to be here. So we're, we're going to jump right in as we do. And uh, We'd really love you to humor us, and um, we're going to skip right to a very intense moment. And you're, you're a unique guest in the sense that there are just so many <laughs> intense moments that we, we could, no one knows where we're going right now <laughs> because there's so, so many options. Um, but we're going to jump to when Delete Uber starts trending and, uh, you know, and there's a big piece about it. And what I'd like you to do, if you will, is is try to actually, before you just tell us about that moment, would try to recollect like where you, what's actually going on in your day. Like tell us, because I, I'd love to understand your true perspective. Like where are you when you find this out? If you can, if you can remember that. I don't know if you remember that detail, but the, the more like bringing it to life for us, you can, that'd be amazing. Yeah, for sure. You know, President Trump was elected in November of 16, inaugurated January of 17. Seven days after that, he did something like the, I think it was the migrant ban or something. So, you know, ban some, some form of immigra uh, immigration into the U.S. And the taxi drivers at JFK decided to uh, do sort of a strike. And there were people protesting at the airport. So this is January 27th, like a week after the nation is, you know, especially San Francisco is is on fire about the world at this point. And I think I'm on vacation in Mexico and get a call from Travis. I don't, hadn't taken vacation in forever. And I get a call saying, you'll never believe this, but we suspended surge. Remember Uber had surge pricing and it was very controversial. People were like, oh my God, you charged me triple price during a snowstorm. Um, and we sort of had for years to try to explain how that was a good thing that it made sure there were rides available. So we suspended surge during the strike. Um, and one guy like, who was on Twitter, some blogger was like, Uber's trying to break the strike. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you're like, we weren't trying to break the strike. We were trying to 
you know, get protesters home from the airport. It was like an act of goodwill, like no deed, good deed goes unpunished. And, and he said, we should just delete Uber. Um, and then it went. That was on Twitter. That's a tweet. It was a tweet. And it went incredibly viral. And it was sort of like this, holy cow, what did we do wrong? Um, and you're talking about 500,000 people deleted their Uber app. And that's like on that day on the, or like over the course over the of course it. of the next three days. Okay, but I mean that's still incredibly short. Yeah, and and you know Uber like the revenue per user is really high, right? If you rode Uber ten times a month, that's twenty bucks, two hundred. That's a big deal. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars in lost revenue for something that we're like, how do we like? What do we do wrong here? And and in retrospect, you know. I was there sort of with my phone ringing off the hook trying to talk to people. And it was the most helpless feeling I'd ever had because this thing took off. No matter how you explained it, it didn't matter. People were angry. This thing had gotten out there. It was an easy protest act, uh, act to pull up your phone, hit you know, hood it, hold down on the Uber app, click the X and delete it. So it was sort of like the ease of protest made it a bigger thing as well. Sort of like the Silicon Valley Bank, you could wire money out right away, made it quick, more go more quickly. It was that kind of thing. And it was it was an amazing feeling of like, holy cow, we're in an environment now. It's like a free fall. Like it's... Yeah. That, and you can't, exp- you don't have time to explain it and it doesn't matter. It doesn't even, yeah, explaining it does, is not even going to help the type of people who are taking that action. So you're on vacation. Are you like... I want to imagine it. Like, are you like literally on the beach and then this is just like, oh my gosh, I like, where's my laptop? <laughs> or, or like, I, I don't know. I just, I, as a, someone who's not had any, um, any crises that reach this level at all, but have my own crises in entrepreneurialist life. I just want to know like how you felt <laughs> and what did you have to do? Like, were you able to do anything at that point? Um, <laughs> I was at dinner at the pool, you know, at a poolside thing, eight, you know, eight o'clock evening ish. And I was like, I got to go take this call. And then obviously, like, it never went back to dinner. I had to tell people I'm dinner with, hey, guys, I got to roll, <laughs> get a laptop, you know, spotty coverage in some hotel in Mexico. And then, you know, hit the tweet stream just to see and then see it getting more angry, more viral, more serious, more widespread. More of my friends who are people I know going, Emil, I can't believe you Uber did this on, on DMs and and then, so me then trying to explain to at least people who had knew me, I said, like, at least they'll listen to me. And they did. But then, like, that's a small set of people. How I make 50 phone calls or, you know, 50 emails? You saved those 50 users. <laughs> but, but, but thought that they were messengers. So, like, maybe I would amplify this so at least people would understand um, what had happened when it stops. And it was just you know, helplessness and anxiousness, sadness that the employees who, um, you know, worked so hard at Uber, who were doing the right thing, felt that, you know, their company was doing the wrong thing because their parents were calling them going like, what are you doing at this company? It was, it was, you know, because most of these startups are younger people. So they haven't been through as many of these kind of moments. Right. Um, so calling the key leaders uh, to help them understand it was it was it was quite a kickoff to what was a you know a, you know, a bad 2017 for Uber generally. <laughs> totally a kickoff to a totally calm year. <laughs> um, so I, I, you mentioned something I want to go deeper on, which is like internal calm. So when something like this happens, uh, you know, or in the Uber situation, I think all of us know probably too much about the external comms. Like we know too much <laughs> relative <laughs> to the situation, like what was going on in the media and whatnot. But but you're mentioning the very real personal situations. You've got young employees who are trying to parse this, trying to explain to their family. Um, what else is going on in internal comms? Like, do you have a Slack that's like blowing up or does someone create like a hashtag delete Uber Slack channel to debate it? Like, what else do you deal with internally at a, in a moment like that that would help us imagine what it's really like to, to be working there? The It's a very difficult situation to deal with something like this because it was so unique. Um, like, when's the last time you heard of a mass, even today, a mass delete app campaign, right? So, so, you know, you tried to put out your message 
uh, like our PR team on Twitter saying, hey, we, we suspended Surge for this reason. We were not we were trying to do, uh, you know, break the strike. We're not strike breakers. But no one's listening to that. No one cares what at Uber is saying on Twitter <laughs> right there. So it was this sort of like scrambling. And, and the weirdest part of it was usually in crises, there's something to do. You know, and there was kind of nothing to do except damage control with the people, like our investors, like what happened, explain to them. And they're like, okay, I get it. What do we do? I'm like, I don't know. What do we do? We tell the world the truth and you sustain it. And like we plan, you know, a future PR thing. We go on TV and talk about it. Who knows? But it was one of these, the most weird crises I've ever been in because not only did we do nothing sort of wrong, but there was no way to correct it. <laughs> and it's having a real business impact. So it's not even just like a bad press situation. It's like there's a very real business impact. So you're feeling that all of a sudden you're reforecasting. I don't I don't know. I'm hypoth I'm hypothesizing here, but you're all of a sudden people are like, wait, my models are wrong. Like it's like a it's a business situation, not just, you know, every press situation could be that, but it's a has a real impact immediately. Yeah, and then and I will give Lyft credit for this. That night they donated a million dollars to the ACLU. <laughs> like, within, <laughs> no joke, within, <laughs> no joke. And I was like, that is some hardcore, wow. whoa wow. stuff. Oh <laughs> my God. <laughs> Media jujitsu. Super jujitsu. And they're like, you know, basically, delete Uber, come on over to Lyft. It was an amazing kind of move. There's so many layers to this one, and one of them is political as well, which I've thought a lot about um, personally, just like what is, how do you even have an appropriate commentary as a company when it's a white hot political issue? But somehow this is all everything and like rolled into one thing. It's like a business problem, it's a press problem, it's visual, it's affecting people, and it's political with Trump and like all these personalities. How do, do you have to navigate the political stuff internally as well? Like are people actually fired up about that? Yeah, I mean, think about this. So then the next, like the very next crisis that happened there was that President Trump invited all the tech leaders to the White House, Mary, ba you know, and, and industrial leaders, Mary Barra, the CEO of GM, Elon Musk, uh, Tim Cook, all, all these folks, and Travis, right? Because Uber was a very important company at this time. And on the heels of that, Uber and Travis became the, you better not go to this Trump thing because, uh, you know, we're going to continue deleting the app thing. So imagine this, you're like, okay, there's a new administration. We have a business that has, can, can be impacted by transportation regulations, labor regulations, whatever. President's invited you and other CEOs to this thing. Your employee base is going, don't go. Your customers are going, don't go. And you, for some reason, become the focus of this whole 20 person CEO meeting. and. You know, you had, he had to call the president and say, I can't, I can't go, sir, you know, Mr. President. And so you're like, how did this, how do we get here to where, you know, somehow we're the target of the ire of what had happened in that election. And, you know, these, our participation in things that other people had done became so, so glaringly controversial. But, uh, but yes, and you had people at the company saying like, well, do you ignore the president? Do you ignore your customer? Like, what do you do? So it was a, it was a really unique time, I'd say. Hey, everybody. Eric here with a word from our sponsor, Pesto Tech. Are you finding it time consuming to hire high quality remote developers? Pesto Tech is a hiring marketplace that makes finding great remote developers fast and easy. They use large language models to evaluate developers along dozens of parameters, including code quality, performance, and security. All you have to do is answer five simple questions on their website, and Pesto Tech will find you world-class remote developers that fit your company's needs. I've heard great things about Pesto Tech from friends like Ryan Hoover, who are investors. So if you need to start hiring developers fast, go to pesto.tech today. That's pesto.tech. It's also just incredibly distracting internally. Like, do you feel as an executive, like, we have so much other stuff to work on. I mean, obviously, it's just so important in the first three days you talk about it, but does it actually become just like the internal topic for a month and you're like, I wish we could focus on the business or something? I just wonder how that feels when you're there and there's just, you know, growing a business is just hard in general. 
yeah, I mean, these, these sorts of things are totally defocusing because you, whatever you have travel, you have planned, you have to cancel whatever sort of planning meetings are, you're early in 20, you know, 2016. So you're thinking about the year ahead and everyone else is watching Twitter and TV and reading about this. So like the whole employee base, employee base is distracted. Um, so it does, it does have a real cost to uh, efficiency and pro you know, productivity at the company. But, you know, the people at the top, well, who else is going to deal, deal with this stuff, right? Who else is going to talk to, you know, go do an uh, uh, impromptu all hands with a group of people who are scared about what this means for the company. Um, so you have, that's where your real leadership skills have to kick in and try to find how to allocate your time how to get what does getting past this problem look like? How do we say how do we not fall so far behind on the productivity that we're trying to do? Um, how do we fix this so next time we're sort of a little like more understanding of the environment so don't you don't trip into something like this again? So it's yeah, it's incredibly distracting. Was there a person who felt incredibly bad because they made the decision? that kicked it all off? Was there someone just like cowering in a corner? I just have to know who was just like totally innocent and just like, oh, don't look at me. Like, I, <laughs> like I almost broke the company, um, you know, because also helping that person, I've had to help, again, different contexts, that person through things. It, was there one person who was like whole teams that decided? No, there's one person who innocently sent out a tweet saying, hey, we are suspending surge pricing due to the, you know, problems at JFK and it was, you know, not a senior person because we, we empowered younger people to, to do this stuff in terms of whether it was a weather crisis or, you know, things like that. So that people didn't think we we're taking advantage of, of hurricanes or, you know, those kinds of things. And so, you know, we had a whole protocol about doing this and someone did it and yeah, you, the, that person was like, Holy cow. <laughs> and, you know, obviously they, they were not. They were not doing the wrong thing. They just got unlucky. Just, just a, a commentary on the times. You know, we're talking about 2017. This was a time where Uber and there were some other companies who were basically like, you know, almost punching bags for for people who just didn't like tech. They they were calling a bunch of nerds like tech bros as if they were doing like cocaine or something all the time, like doing these egregious things. They're just nerds building these companies. And there was what's different now is. Tech learned, I feel like the industry built immunity to attacks from inside the company. It would be like less than 1% of employees or just a handful of employees who would go out to journalists and they would concoct this you know, story that was out of line with what was actually happening that was very negative to the, to the company. And I feel like we learned uh, enough from this that we started to build our own like internal media, even if just on Twitter, like people who would just push back. And that kind of culminated in, you know, Elon is the most like, you strongest example of someone who just says, fuck you, like you're wrong. And you're, if you're against the company, you're fired. And, you know, I'm going to just be, be just like contradict you in public. And I feel like if Uber was having those crises in 2023, you could have maybe done something similar, but maybe at the time we, we just as an industry had to be apologetic because we just didn't have the, the resources to like, you know, directly fight, fight back. That, and that was the advice we were getting, right. Is like, you know, just take it. Yeah, I mean, there, were, there was a turning point in 2014, 15, 16, where the tech press became much more critical uh, and less, you know, adulation about startups and more about, you know, the challenges the, uh, in them. And, and it was a it was a long term change, but it definitely changed. And at that time, companies uh, didn't have their own channels, their own Twitter followings. They didn't sort of have their internal um, sort of comms thing structured in a way to to be responsive to these types of things. Um, so yes, we were caught a little flat footed. But today, I do think you know co companies can withstand some of these things, especially when they're not true. They contain them. They and then also there's and this is a bad thing, but but people don't trust the media more today than they did seven years ago. So everything they hear is taken with a grain of salt. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of bad sides to that for as a country, but right now, at least there's always time for another version of the story or someone else's point of view on that story. And that often leaves people like, okay, it's a food fight. I don't know who to believe. I'm, you know, I'm not going to condemn anyone or praise anyone.
And it seems like the two approaches are either the the Elon approach or the Travis approach. Either you're you know totally outside of the the media build, building heads down, and it seems like they're crushing it, or you're like you know in the media every day and you know willing to contradict you know push back on things that are wrong and and make sure that your your narrative is getting across. Yeah, there there are a few companies like Brian at Airbnb who just are somehow because of their talent able to f- float above it all. Right, <laughs> they're just. You know, it's the nicest company. You would never think that anything bad happened in Airbnb. And he just has a persona and a way of talking about his company that's really uh, transcends sort of some of this food fight thing that I, I found really I find really impressive. I think it's really impressive. I have a I, I I'm a generally extremely optimistic person, but I have a I have a streak of still concern that people that just the the desire to rip someone off a pedestal is so strong. <laughs> That the higher the pedestal floats, that's, that's up there. just a matter of time for Brian. <laughs> just the fall, the more bones are there to crush at the end. I just really, I really hope that that's completely wrong. I'm, I'm an optimist at heart, but it, it, it scares me a little bit that it's just maybe not yet. You know, in a sad kind of way. Hopefully, hopefully that's incorrect. Hopefully, I mean, look, I, I, I joke with people that Elon's Captain America. If you take down Elon, you're taking, you know, the American dream and immigrant built all these great companies. And yes, he's got got things, but but yes, we have that nature in our in our press and so on to take down the top guy or gal, which which we hope doesn't uh, doesn't take down everybody. Then there's no heroes. <laughs> then what? Why don't we transition to a different story? Maybe let's transition to the the China one because that one was so high stakes in so many ways. I mean, I'd be scared doing business in China. Period. At a at a high level, based on what you know has happened to other people in, in China recently. I, why don't you take us through like being on the ground doing some of these like some of the the most intense or craziest things that that happened there? Yeah. So in two thousand fourteen, right? You have to imagine yourself back to almost you know uh, nine ten years ago now. The optimism of U.S.-China relationships was at its peak. Mark Zuckerberg would go there and try to convince President Xi to get Facebook uh, there. Uh, Tim Cook was there all the time. I mean, it was literally, it was like, maybe we can open up and may- there might be a chance where we can do business there. Chinese were, a government was thinking about giving banking licenses to Goldman Sachs. And it was, this, there was, it was still the same president, but just a different time. And... You know, we had this business that didn't seem sensitive. It wasn't social media. It didn't have sort of prop, you know any you know uh, uh, way of sort of changing what people think about Chinese as a government. So we were sort of allowed to slide through um, as not really a you know tech business or a social media business. And it was amazing because uh, a lot of Chinese folks wanted to work for an American company because it was ex- just exciting and different. Uh, the mayors in China who care about transportation in their cities, they loved us because they were like, they don't want a monopoly like Didi, a monopoly. They wanted us. So every time I go to a different city in China, the mayor would want to meet with me or Travis and like sit down and have tea and talk about welcoming the city. And do you want this in this building? And what can we do for you? And you're like, this is amazing. Um, could the competitive environment, however, was like nothing else I've ever seen. I mean, talk about Didi, they, they, Didi, which was the main competitor, texting our drivers saying, Uber's not going to pay you this week to try to cause a rush at our office, you know, with employees and doing stuff like that. Being, you know, I didn't love being followed every minute in China when I was there. I didn't love getting the same hotel room every day, knowing that, you know, so feeling like I was being observed in, in the room and, all those things, uh, but uh, but yeah, it was it was wild times out there and good times. And thank God we sold the company to Didi in 2016 because in today's environment, this is none of this is possible. Um, so th- those were good times. I mean, doing the acquisition in 60 days, and and the way I did it was we raised three and a half billion dollars from the public investment fund in Saudi in May of 2016. The next day I called my counterpart at Didi and I said, I'm going to, you know, we've got three and a half billion more dollars to, to blow in China if you want to fight this war or we could figure out a deal. And like she immediately came to San Francisco, you know, we kept our phones outside. So no one was tapping the phone, shades drawn. Um, 
I was only allowed in there with her and her whole team until she trusted me enough. And I was allowed to bring my people to try to come to a deal. And then we met in a secret location in Macau, you know, to close the deal with lawyers. We didn't leave for three days, uh, you know, uh, high, high intensity environment. They didn't want the Chinese regulatory authority knowing, knowing about the deal. So we had to sign it and close it the same day and tell our own employees. And it was, it was wild times. So that has to be kept, that has to be kept super under wraps in every, in every way. Like how, how you just described some of the mechanics, but how do you go about, how do you go about secret keeping on that level? Because we're just talking about, talking about the, the fates of so many people, you know, governments who do want to know all these details. Like, is there any other, besides just whisking lawyers away to Macau, is there, I just feel like there's more to it. <laughs> I want to know, I want to know how you keep a deal so big, you know, under wraps, uh, like, how else, what else goes into that? I mean, sp speed is a weapon, right? Speed, the, the faster you go. Um, and that actually forces negotiators on both sides to actually come to agreements sooner. So it forces actually, yeah, it's a forcing function. And it was, you know, you had to have lawyers under like triple, double secret NDA, right? And then um you had to increasingly over time bring more and more people into the deal and swear them to secrecy. And, you know, we kind of got lucky that we got the 60 days without knowing it. But I will, I never forget the day that this was announced and I had to go to our employees in China who were so dedicated. They bled Uber Black. And I had to tell them that we got sold and they were like a room full of Craig crying employees no. who had just oh. made a ton of money, but were devastatingly sad. And I had Gene, my counterpart there, and I was like, look, they're, I remember saying this, they're not monsters because the competition was so fierce that everyone thought the other side was a monster. Um, it, it was it was one of the most wild experiences I ever had. And, and there were some weird things that happened in China. When you have a Chinese subsidiary, you have to have two Chinese citizens sign the docs, so they technically own the company. So I had to locate the two people who owned the Chi Uber China company, who, if they absconded, not, you know, it, it was a problem. So you had this other effort to do this, to get them in the same place, to get these like docs with red wax on them. I mean, it was a very, very complicated thing to do in 60 days. <laughs> And then this is like, I don't remember when different, when each different chat app comes out, like Signal and all this different stuff, but something I, another like just detail I'm curious about is even just communicating internally, like how do you make sure that this stuff is not getting out? And I, I'm, I don't feel like I'm a super paranoid person, but it just feels hard. It just feels like technically hard to make sure that you're messaging. You don't accidentally put someone on CC, <laughs> just stupid stuff, you know? Like, uh, so is there, is there any other mechanics to that? Like, was there a chat app that was, you know, better at the time or are you just like on Slack and stuff just on the channel where you're like, I hope this is really super lock symbol. <laughs> well, so, so Slack hadn't il infiltrated Uber yet in 2016. Oh, right. Okay. So people were using Telegram or, or text uh, you know, Telegram, um, you know, was a good app for that. But also I've learned that my emails were like, people would send me an email and my reply, my answers would be yes, no, or call me. That was, that was it. <laughs> so that, um, no email that I wrote with the details of this thing would be floating around. So I had to keep a lot of it. I had a core team around me that were like deal machines, but yes, it was, it, it's hard to keep that stuff uh, down, but, you know, Uber was a pretty secretive company generally and compartmentalized. So we sort of had a head start start on that. And Didi didn't want it either because they didn't want their employees to think they were, they lost and they had to buy Uber. So it, we all had the same incentive. You're yeah, there's no asymmetric. You weren't worried. There was no asymmetric warfare from that component. It was everyone had the same motivation. It's just more of a technical thing. Like, uh, as someone who has occasionally put the wrong person on CC, I just, <laughs> I just feel paranoid yes no call me <laughs> that's the, yeah <laughs> yeah exactly i'm learning things i'm learning things because that yeah that's honestly that's a good strategy and the and the acquisition is it as simple as someone throws out a number the, the other party throws out a counter number and you come somewhere in the middle or like what, what was it actually like oh no i mean this is this is like you know 
the, 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 you know, is it Chinese companies are headquartered if they want foreign investment in the Caymans. So you're merging a Caymans Corp with a, you know, two Caymans Corp. And, and in, in private to private deals, all, it almost becomes the ratio. What ratio of the resulting company do I get? Right. It's like a blend, like you're pouring water into a cup and it's like how much. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. And, you know, you're, there's a lot of chicken there because you're doing subsidies to get riders. You're moving market share. China has, I think, 100 cities with 10 million people are over. The U.S. has like one. <laughs> so you, the, the vastness of China and the amount of expenditure. So there was a lot of incentive for us to get that deal done so we stop spending money and for them so they could stop subsidizing um, to do that. So it all just comes down to the ratio. But but the complexity of the cross-border deal with the regulatory where where the entities are was was serious. And I, I think we talked in a previous interview that you and Lyft almost got there um, and that that was a big missed opportunity for, for both sides. Twice. Um, I was super in favor of the deal um, just because, again, the subsidy war was just unhealthy for the system, right? Um, uh, and I got, I got there once and then John Zimmer and, uh, blew it from, from Lyft side because... Uh, he didn't want to agree to sort of the, like, you know, usually you acquire a company, the, the, the leaders of the company acquire stay in on for a couple of years. They invest into some, some amount of what they do. He didn't want to agree to that. Uh, uh, because he didn't trust that we would give him that. It was for him. It was, you were talking about like hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, up front and then a few hundred to come. And he, he just didn't, he blew it on that point. And then some other time. Travis just didn't want to do it because he thought, you know, we had the upper hand there. And I think, you know, had we done that, the U.S. market share, the U.S. marketplace would have been a lot healthier for rideshare. But it didn't happen. And look at what Lyft now. Lyft now is trading at $3.5 billion. They raised $8 billion. I just, I'm going to go super general, if you'll humor me. What, like, what takeaways do you have from a human perspective on those two deals that don't come to fruition that you just mentioned? Like, it does sound... It, it the numbers can work, everything can be good, and a human being who has just bled to to start something has to sign on the dotted line. And so, I, have you learned anything as a leader, and that would make you feel like those deals maybe could happen, or you'd know what to say, or I don't know. I'm, I'm just curious. yeah, no. To I mean, I spend a lot of time thinking about this, and I often tell people. So don't read these negotiation books because the, with the negotiation books, what McKinsey tells you about BATNA, best alternative to negotiated agreement. Shocking. McKinsey doesn't have the answer to this. <laughs> You're blowing my mind. <laughs> it's all sort of just half the, half the story. The other half is what is happening with this person on the other side of the table. What is their mental calculus? And their mental calculus includes emotions and call it, feelings of winning or losing uh, where they are in their life and so on. And, you know, over time, I've, I've really incorporated that into my thinking and negotiations. So what would I have done different with Zimmer in this case? I probably should have gone to his house and sat with him and be like, let's talk about this because that's, this is not the case, man. We, you know, you build something great and just done, you know, just went there and met him where he was at emotionally. And, and it was a money thing too, but just like really kind of worked it out. And on the other thing with Travis, I, you know, I probably should have, you know, just said, you know, said, let me illustrate what this world looks like and this world looks like and been pushier about it. But uh, because he just didn't you know, like those guys. <laughs> so right, it's so, normal when you spend your time in battle, it's normal to not like. And then basically that that's that can be some of the core issues with MA is like ultimately then people are like, well now we're one. And then and then you hear about all these flame outs where acquisitions are terrible. And it's usually because at root, the people sitting across the table were like, fuck you. <laughs> You know, and then you ask those people to all play nice later when they've been, you know, so it makes perfect sense, but it, it's like a, what can we all learn? Because often, you know, it, the other side could be positive if those people could all come to that place. Yeah. You know? and, and you could, you could ring fence this or that. You're like, here's how we do it. Right. Like, and let's, let's be cold. Let's be business people about this. This makes sense. So now it's just a, you know, 
who do you want to spend time with or not and how much? So let's just break that problem down into its chunks. And, and then, you, then you might realize like, okay, well, this is probably doable for like a really smart business deal. If this is the combo of what this looks like and that illustration of what this looks like um, is really powerful negotiating tools. You know, it would have been in both, in both scenarios. Helping someone live in that new world, like how, like basically illustrating that new world, like literally, like I'm, I'm going to over-exaggerate maybe, but to the extent where you're like, you want a nicer office than the other previous CEO, just because you love that office. And that's, you're going to feel great if you walk into the building and that's your office. It's like getting to a place where you're like, let's, let's live this world. Um, that makes a lot of yeah, sense. So it's not up here in ethereal. It's like, it's like what happens every day. Cause when you break it down to every day, then you're like, okay, I'm going to see this guy once every three weeks. Like, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah. You're going to do a, a meeting together it, once yeah. or whatever. Yeah. I want to segue to the, the Tim Cook and Apple um, stories. Because I know Super Pump got that wrong. They got a lot of things wrong. Most of it wrong. Um, I thought it was just a documentary. <laughs> was it not? <laughs> okay. Live footage, yeah. No, no. And we, we can talk about what you know, the things they got wrong. You, you've also talked about it. But maybe let's, let's, let's talk about the, the Tim Cook and Apple. Uh, what made that so interesting, so intense? What would what, you learn from that? Yeah. Well, we, so we had, I would say, three meetings with with Tim Cook and Apple that were, uh, we, where Travis and I were together. And I don't know if everyone does these meetings with Apple, but they're multi-hour meetings. And I don't know how the CEO of the largest company in the world has that much time to spend, but he did because he liked that we were in China. He liked that we were doing one of the first um, bit app, apps that was maybe making something change in the real world in real time. And generating revenue, so it was a lot of good. We were doing maps, and he was competing with Google Maps, so we had a lot of relevance to him. And so, two-hour brainstorming meetings, and Travis would pace around, would pace around the deck, and all of them were really productive and great. And then two two different meetings went weird. Weird stuff happened. So we had <laughs> we taught. He was picking our brain in this latest meeting about China, China, China. How are you doing in China, China, China? And we're very open. It's not like you do an NDA with Apple or Tim Cook. You just kind of go talk to Tim Cook. It's not, you know, it's not, you can't, it's harder to ask for an NDA or something like that from a guy like that. So I got home or back to the office with Travis. And then Eddie Q, who is always in the meetings, calls me. He's like, I got to tell you something. We're about to announce a billion dollar investment in Didi. And this was the same day we had just met with Tim Cook and he's picking our brain about our China business. And I was, I was like, Oh my God, I got played by Tim Cook. <laughs> Holy cow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Holy, Holy shit. shit. And that was my, my I feeling. Just, how does that feel? Like, do you feel like, wow, he's playing 40 chess or, or do you just, do you reach offended? out to Tim Cook? Or you're like, yeah, what do the you fuck, do man? text him and you're like, <laughs> WTF? Like, what? I mean, yeah, tra Travis texted <laughs> yeah. him exactly that. He's like, maybe you could have told me, it would have been a courtesy. I still want to share something with you, but you know, he was like basically, sorry guys, play you know, big boy ball. Welcome to big boy ball. <laughs> wow. How, and, but that coming back to the people dynamics, like, do you actually feel like that is fair play and that it's just like he made a calculated choice and obviously you're gonna trust him less? Or do you feel like it's actually kind of a weird move? Because who knows what, you know, he needs to do in future rounds with every person he's going to meet. And it feels it feels a little strange to me, even though, sure, super powerful. But I don't know. It seems like not a long term game kind of move. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have done that in, in reverse. Um, and I think the Eddie Q and I had known each other for years. He called me and he knew it, by the tone of his voice that this was not something he would probably do either. So it was, a, it was definitely one of those things that I put in my brain to, to remember and those kinds of things you know, that some people do that and some people don't. And I, I don't want, I'm not one of them. And you don't know who they are. Like, like in any given circumstance, you don't know who that person is, you know, because you, so it's just a, uh, and I think that's a, this is another general question, but coming off of, you know, everything that happened in 2017 and everything that happened in general, do you come away from these experiences in business as you go forward? You do many things now, like a little more paranoid. Like, I'm just curious about the how how it all hits. 
more able to deal with it and more paranoid, right? So I'm more paranoid about um, internally what like, I really didn't understand that when a company is being sort of attacked from the outside, um, the it, there's a lot of people inside who sort of rebel against the company. They agree with what the outside people are saying. And that's leaks happen. You're not one team it's, like it's, against the world. Yes. Yeah. Especially when it's repeated and um, and sort of you know every day there's something there, and that disunity is is very hard to operate against. And so, would I do it again? You know, you'd have to sort of you know deal with the disunity, like get the people out, uh, make really hard decisions really fast, um, or fix them. You know, you, and some of these things are harsh, like what Elon did. You know, uh, at Twitter, he's been criticized for it. So he took a Slack channel where everyone's complaining about back to work. He's like, okay, everyone on that gone, fired. And, it, it, you, and I know why he did it um, because of this. He said, you know, he didn't want the internal dissension at any cost because he said that's going to break the company. On the on the other hand, I've learned that you know to just be paranoid about you know cascading crisis once something feels vulnerable, so many other people see that vulnerability and want to write or talk about it. So it's really bad things don't come in ones. <laughs> they come in like threes or fives. Um, so you kind of have to be prepared for a sustained sort of situation. And you do have to have stronger, stronger internal messaging about what you're doing and why. And repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. But having your PR, the, the worst thing in the world is have your PR team turn against sort of you, which we had that because their access, I can't even imagine. their megaphone access, and we just didn't know it till it was too late. I, I think a lot about selection filters in the same context of like, how do you, sure, you can go like Elon to that channel of all the people complaining about a company and be like, hey, thanks for outing yourself. Like you're all fired. Um, that also creates a certain culture. After that, you have to worry. Obviously, people aren't going to do that again. You know, so it was like a one timer usually. <laughs> um, but how do you prevent people from coming in the first place? Like, do you do you have thoughts? Who are going to be disloyal this? during hard times? Yeah. Coming about selection filters. Like, how do you kind of create that filter coming in? And not just I'm not just talking about like hiring, but can you broadcast a certain message of like, to make sure that the people come are aligned. Uh, did you have an opportunity to do that at Uber, you feel? I mean, I think, yes, you can do that to a large degree. You'll never be perfect, right? The 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 uh, Brian Armstrong Coinbase ma memo that he sent out um, was sort of a version, yeah, which which is a version of this is who we are. If you if you you should know it on the way in, and I think companies need to be smarter about that. We were pretty good about that. Um, but we got big, so big so fast. We went from 200 employees to 20,000 in three years. So and in so many countries, in so many different ways that there was no way that filter was going to be strong enough because no one had ever grown that fast. Not Google, nobody in terms of number of employees. Um, but I do think you should, you can and should have filters like that. I think it's, it's almost irresponsible to build a company and not have a filter like that these days. Um, because you are going to have mismatch, and I do think we're a little bit of an, a bear market now. So you're you're in the a little bit more in the driver's seat to be choosy on who you let in and who you want in. Um, but some of the tone gets set too. Is is you know what's your, we used to, used to joke if you're complaining about the cafeteria food, your boss should be fired because they're, you're not being managed well, right? Or, or, you know, no quinoa, or we're gonna have cheap food, or, you know, you have, there are messages you could send by how you spend money and how you do things, which again, sort of attract or repel certain kinds of people. Right, there's no amount of car corporate values that, that can get around some of those actions that actually tell people how you feel about things and make them stick around or not. At the, yeah. Z z zooming out a bit, when you think about the the legend of Uber and how it continues to be to be told and will be told, what do you think is 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 most misunderstood, even from people within tech, who you know, not just people who've only seen the show or something, but people who who were around during this time, at, you know, not at Uber necessarily, but you know, within tech, like what do you think is is most misunderstood? You know, the, there's this notion that the rule breaking or bending the rules on ride sharing was, was a bad thing. And 
one shouldn't have done that. And if you think about that, you're like, okay, well, um, if we take the world as it is and you succumb to sort of the sort of small mafias that these taxi uh, people created or cartels they did with the politicians and that sort of payola scheme that they had. If you don't break that, well, then you're going to have the old system. And so we broke it. And people are like, why'd you break it? And you're like, well, because this is a better system for everyone. It's better for drivers, better for riders. And guess what? We won. You know why? Because China, India, US, Brazil, Russia, all of them now legalize ride sharing. Most of the world has listened to their citizens and said, you were right, we were wrong. And so had we not done that, and if we play by the rules, we would have still been in that world. And, you know, I, I think it's misunderstood that, well, the world moved because we moved it. And every country in the world now adopted something that's better for their citizens. And therefore, we were vindicated. It was a form of corporate civil disobedience. Like these were wrong. These were wrong. And, and we were going to disobey them because they were wrong and we were, we were doing something that was right. And we were vindicated by, you know, ride sharing being legal all over the world essentially now. And if, But I feel like in Silicon Valley, the culture at one point prized these things. Like I, I do feel like it has been the concept that that's not prized or not good to, to kind of question the status quo and just effectively if there's some statute somewhere that says you didn't do it right, you're wrong, like... I don't know. It's more shock. Isn't it more shocking that people in tech think that? <laughs> like, like, I, I don't know. Didn't something like didn't the snake start eating its own tail or something? I, 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 it's just strange to even hear you say that that's the misunderstood part. Yeah. Because that sounds like the cool part. <laughs> the, the, I, th I think it's a little bit of this this sort of narrative, this anti-tech narrative has has made that not a prized value. Uh, move fast and break things is now bad. It was good. Right. There are these things where, uh, you know, AI is going to do this. Let's stop it. It's bad. You know, not about what good it could do. So there is a little bit more focus on the negative, uh, which I don't understand because our government works slower than it ever has. So you're like, OK, well, should we wait? Like, what do we do? <laughs> do we just wait for something to happen um, or do we try to do it? You know, D do you wish that you could have? Uh, been more a bit more slick and i say slick in both the positive and maybe negative ways like maybe transcended above it all in the way that you described brian chesky or or been a bit more like elon and just be, been more aggressive um given that you guys were already thrown in the food fight and it was hard to to get outside of it you know against your will um i've thought about this a lot i think it's a really hard question um in some ways i believe that had we turned the corner a little bit toward being a little more Chesky like a little earlier, um, because we went from insurgent to the man really quickly. Like we were, we were the underdog. And then in like 18 months, we became the overdog like very fast. And we launched Uber Eats. We're in 92 countries. We're on magazine covers. I was most, you know, most out of startup in the world. It was fast growing. And, and, that made the spotlight shinier and had we sort of like smoothed some of the edges a bit and realized that like, hey, we're now we're going to people aren't going to rooting for us anymore. They're rooting against us. So we have to take a different approach um, was probably the better answer at that moment. We were talking about how, you know, you had government pushback at times. We were talking off air how at one point you had a, a SWAT team descend in one of your regions. Like, tell us about one of the crazy, uh, crazy experiences there. And this relates to sort of the things that people understand about Uber. Like, the resistance was unbelievable, right? This Las Vegas, uh, when we launched in Las Vegas, um, a couple of police officers sort of ordered the, the, the a car. This poor guy kind of rolls up to pick him up in Toyota Camry. And they have a fully dressed SWAT team with machine guns take him out of the car to arrest him. And you're like, what, you know, the fear that caused. Um, in Italy, the taxi officers were so serious, they put pictures of our female general manager on the on the po light posting saying, you know, you should hurt this person, essentially, um, all over the city. You know, all kinds of crazy rules in, in, in South Korea. 
it was it was legal for foreigners to take a ride share, but not legal for Koreans to take a ride share. So if a Korean got in an Uber, they would like arrest the Korean person. <laughs> um, just you know, you know, L.A. had rules on the color of socks you could wear. You know, they, you know, Germany had a rule that if you took someone to the airport, you couldn't take another passenger back to the city. You had to go all the way back to the city and then go back to the airport. And it was called the return to base rule to protect the, the, the limo industry. I mean, you had all kinds of rules you're like, you know, that you're facing that were kind of insane. And we were, yeah, we were, we were not following these rules because they were dumb and they were bad for everybody. Wow. In closing here, you know, Jesse and I as entrepreneurs have both had our own versions of crises where some people stepped up and were super loyal and some people, <laughs> some people stabbed us in the back in, in our own way. And, um, you know, and you certainly had that at a, at a much bigger scale. Um, I'm curious when you advise people who've gone through, you know, versions of what, what I just discussed, do you th say, Hey, do you advise them? Hey, never think about it again. Just like move on with life. Like it's just business. It happens. Do you say like, Hey, use that as motivation to like beat them uh, in whatever you do next. Like, how do you get over when someone like really fucks you over? It's really hard, especially if it's your life's work or it's sort of so a mission that you were that you were on that was taken from you or, or so much money was taken. Yeah, yeah. So significantly diverted because because of that. So uh, number one, I tell people just again, make this filter on the front end a lot better. It like, forces you that that at least you do. That's forward looking. Backward looking, you have a responsibility to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else if possible. And so if this person or this firm um, is out there, you know, uh, behaving this way, and you know, you should be a resource for other entrepreneurs about how they behave. But, you know, that's just how it is, and it's it's all factual. Then, you know, maybe these firms will change if they know that there's consequences, or these people will change. There's consequences to their actions. I mean, I don't think it's about vindictiveness, but it is about making sure we're paying it forward to the next people, who, so it doesn't happen to them. And that's sort of the mindset I would put them in, and that's more constructive. You've been uh, you've been very constructive in, in this interview, uh, Emil. Thank you so much for coming on in the arena and sharing your your journey with us. Thanks for listening to In the Arena. If you enjoyed the conversation, please like, subscribe, and share by leaving us a review and telling everyone you know. And please feel free to reach out to us on Twitter at in the arena underscore pod. We'd love your suggestions on who else has an intense experience to share.